Good evening, everyone. Buonasera a tutti. Welcome um, to the Gregorian University, to the Center for Interreligious Studies. And uh, today uh, we are just ending a session of studies. I will explain a little bit later uh, on a comparative uh, theology of religions. And uh, so we end with a public, uh, with a public lecture, with a public uh, uh, session. Uh, on uh, this important si subject that you can see behind me. And uh, so the, 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 this is an, a great occasion, a occasion because we had uh, the second annual meeting um, on the comparative theology of religions, um, which started um, just a, a few, like last year we can say, and then uh, with the uh, participation with the um, participation of uh, the University of Bonn and the Faculty of uh, Catholic Theology in Bonn with the um, Gregorian University, the Center for Interreligious Studies and uh, John Paul II, uh, Interreligious Center for Interreligious Dialogue uh, here in Rome at the Angelicum. And so uh, we are very uh, pleased to have with us uh, two scholars that uh, will give, uh, will give uh, further development to our uh, session that we, have, we had yesterday uh, evening and, uh, and today, today morning. And so we have um, uh, today um, a particular session, open session, to comparative theology, theory, and practice. And uh, so I, I would like just to give the floor to the first speaker, um, Klaus von Storch, who is a well-known scholar in a contab a com a comparative uh, theology. Um, and uh, he will uh, talk about the topic, he will explain us, will uh, introduce us to the uh, comparative uh, theology. And, um, and then uh, let me open. Uh, his CV. Uh, at present, um, he is professor in, for systematic theology and head of the International Center for Comparative Theology and Social Issues at the Catholic Theological Faculty of Bonn, uh, Bonn University in uh, Germany. Uh, as I said, he is a well-known scholar, and recently he published also a book on uh, uh, Mary in the Quran. Um, a very important book. I think w today we will uh, also talk about uh, this issue with the second uh, speaker. And he's uh, well known because also uh, um, had uh, got a, an international book award for the book of the year uh, on Islam, uh, uh, on the category of Islamic studies from the Islamic Republic, uh, Republic of uh, uh, Iran. He was also a research fellow at Georgetown, and the first he was a scholar at the University of uh, Paderborn uh, in, uh, in Germany. So th thank you very much for being with us. Klaus, the floor is yours. So thank you so much for the kind introduction and the invitation to Rome. I'm very glad that we can meet here as a group and that we have now the occasion to explain the idea of comparative theology a bit to you. So I try to give this introductory speech and then after half an hour I will turn over to my colleague Nasrin Bani Asadi who will give the uh, practical part and talking about Mary in the Quran and how to use it for Islamic anthropology. So my uh, my aim is to uh, tell you a bit about the aims of comparative theology, the, uh, the spiritual basis, the methods, and the results it can achieve in a more general way. So let me start with the aims. Comparative theology, in contrast to comparative religion, aims at doing theology. So it wants to seek for truth, it wants to do faith-seeking understanding, as we would say in the Christian tradition. So first of all, it's about a new and better understanding of your own faith, 
whatever this faith is. So I, as a Catholic, I'm doing Catholic theology and try to explore Christian doctrine when I'm doing comparative theology. The idea behind is that, of course, I can learn something on Catholic doctrine, on the doctrine of my religion, also in comparing it with other fields. Like, in my own education, it was always clear I have to read philosophers, for example, even atheist philosophers, and see how can, I can learn from them. But usually, reading the Quran or reading Holy Scriptures from other religions is not part of that education, and you don't expect it as a source for understanding. It's usually only dealt with apologetically, and that's what we try to change. So to, to see whether it's possible to do constructive theology with the help of dialogue with other religions. Of course, this only works if we really try to understand the other religion, to understand theologians from other religions. So it's not only about a new and better understanding of your own faith, but also of the religious other and the diversity of opinions and ideas and challenges that we can have if we engage with people from other religions. And a decisive tool here, which characterizes very much the atmosphere in which um, comparative theology is done, is the idea of friendship. Uh, because sometimes if I'm friends with somebody, I can understand something which is, seems to be very alien to me. I can even understand how this person is dedicated to an idea that I don't like. To my students, I always explain like different uh, football clubs and the one is supporter of the one club in Rome and there's another one in Rome. I don't know how AS Roma and Lazio Roma love each other, but maybe not too much. At least this is always the case in Germany with those clubs who are quite close. And then, of course, it might happen that your best friend or very good friend is supporting the wrong uh, team. And then that friendship might help you to understand something of his love to his team, uh, which still is not my team afterwards, but I can uh, understand not only my friend, but also the ideas he has, the commitment he or she has. So philia, friendship, is very much also a tool of understanding and a precondition to open, to be open-minded in dialogue and to seek for understanding. So we, comparative theology wants to be a theology which is not developed for dialogue in theologizing theoretically about dialogue, but it wants to use dialogue. It, wants to use cooperation with scholars from other religions to develop something with them which will help to enrich their own theology. So it wants to overcome binaries and reifications among re um, religions. And in the end, it also wants to make possible an appreciation of those people and from other religions in their faith. And that's, of course, something that usually in Catholic theology is done by, Catholic, by, by a theology of religion. So let me just say why I prefer to make it in the way to, to do the job of theology of religions by doing comparative theology. So the idea I have is, and this is a specific philosophical approach to comparative theology that not everybody buys, but my idea is that uh, we have a certain depth grammar within uh, every language game, every uh, account to the world, every world picture. And sometimes if we look at that depth grammar, we see that there are hidden convergences on a regulative level. So you, we follow certain rules, and those rules lead to different language games, but if I play in the other language game, I can understand the rules and learn from them, even if it's not my game. So uh, let me just give one example. Sometimes we, if we look at the surface level of grammar, we think like we have fasting in Christianity, we have fasting in Islam, so there must be something similar in fasting, and then I look 
well, how is fasting in Islam different from fasting in Christianity? But uh, if I use the method of comparative theology, I'm not the outside and just looking, here's fasting, there's fasting. But the first step is always to turn over, to leave your armchair, go in the other religious tradition and try to learn from it. And which means at that point also to practice it. So to ask your Muslim colleagues or friends, are you allowed to participate in their way of fasting and seeing where this does lead to. And when I did that for the first time, I remember I was kind of 15 years old, first time in Morocco. My sister is married with an American person, so I visited their family. And I was, just because of curiosity, I participated in doing the Ramadan to understand what happens around. But the interesting thing was that I did not only learn a lot on myself, that's quite hard at a long, sunny day not to eat and to drink, but it also related me in a very deep way to my, the Muslim part of my family. They were really amazed, why is this young man doing that kind of fasting? Uh, they saw a kind of appreciation for their tradition through that. And so I felt very welcomed. And they welcomed me also in the evening to share the breaking of the fast. And the first moment was eating a date, which is for many Muslims like this, because it's also tradition coming from the Prophet Muhammad. And so we were standing there in a circle, listening to the recitation of the Quran. Of course, I was very hungry. It was a long day. I was really longing for eating something. And I had the date there. And still I heard that wonderful, I thought, music. I didn't know what it is. Uh, and then I waited for the day together with everybody, sitting in the circle. And that in the moment when you get the sign, everybody takes the date. Of course, as a Catholic, that reminded me somehow of the Holy Eucharist, standing, uh, if you're in a group, you can have it like this, that you... Uh, in German, we take it like this, the Holy Eucharistic. Uh, so that's why maybe uh, I had that association, but I couldn't do anything with the association. I didn't understand it at all. But the association is another one than comparing fasting with fasting. The practice of fasting brought me to a point where I started to understand something which is on the, surf on the surface level, something completely else. I understood how what happens here can create communion and how eating together after fasting can have, be a spiritual experience. And uh, so uh, when a comparative theologian is discovering things like this, he does not want to say, well, so Muslim fasting is like participating in the Holy Eucharist. Of course not. But you, the, the question is then, can I learn something from that kind of participation in that ritual for my own rituals, without equating them, without saying it's the same thing, it stays different. But it might be, and it was enriching for me to understand now why in the old tradition of my own Catholic faith, we didn't eat before having the Holy Eucharist. I was only aware one hour you shouldn't eat before, and I know that there are different understandings in France and Germany about that. What does it mean? Uh, it's quite funny uh, whether you, it's also about wine or not, and many questions you can have in different countries. But I never understood why. Why wouldn't I eat breakfast before going to the church? And that experience in the Muslim context helped me uh, to get a new account to the idea of going to the Eucharist without eating before, and really having also a bodily desire for the body of Christ. So um, that only works if you understand that religions are very much about rule following in a certain form of life, in a certain context, and that you only understand what religions say in their doctrine if this doctrine is embedded in such a practice in forms of life. And this is something like uh, what I learned here, that the break of fasting and the ritual prayer in Ramadan can be helpful somehow to have a deeper understanding of the Holy Eucharist. 
or another example would be God's beauty, which is so important and wonderfully described in Hans Urs von Balthasar's theological work. But I got uh, the, my approach to von Balthasar is very much informed by the way how Muslims celebrate the beauty of God in the recitation of the Quran. So that kind of beauty that they encountered in that moment of fasting and waiting for the day, that kind of beauty, which is uh, for um, Navid Kermani, for example, the most important uh, um, encounter. So Navid Kermani, um, a Muslim writer who is uh, very important in Germany, he wrote that first book, God is Beautiful, on the beauty of God. And uh, he tries to, under, to make understandable that the beauty is the concept which helps you to understand everything in Islam. So you have to look at everything from an aesthetical point of view, not an ethical point of view, and that it will open up a lot of paths of understanding. What happened to me, and uh, this was due to Navid Kamani, but again, it was not only about understanding Islam, it was giving a new understanding of my own tradition, of the tradition of Catholic sacraments, and how important the aesthetical dimension is in, in this context. So um, that's about the aims. Uh, that now, what kind of attitude we try to use? And of course, this is also talking about the spirituality of dialogue. But I think it's important that here it's the spirituality of an academic enterprise of comparative theology. And the first thing is that, of course, you have to be aware that your own understanding is limited, that you're just a human. So, uh, so there is, uh, what is needed is a kind of humility, because otherwise you wouldn't do a theology. A theology, if it wants to uh, seek for understanding, it means that you don't understand everything. And it's quite clear if you look at the doctrine, uh, the uh, Constitution on Revelation of the Second Vatican Council, Dei Verbum, it always distinguishes between the ultimate truth and the truth that we have already understood, the veritas capta and the veritas ultima. And it's quite uh, important that also the church, and me as a theologian trying to think through what the church is saying, that we don't have the truth. Even Pope Benedict, who is not the first relativist you would have in mind, always in his preaching said, the church doesn't have the truth, doesn't own the truth, we don't have the truth. It's the other way around. The truth tries to have us, and another have, has us completely. So we are seeking truth. We are on the way, like uh, the dogmatic constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, says we are this uh, people of God on the pilgrimage, and we have to learn. So that's why have, we have to be humble. And we might learn things that we didn't expect. So uh, that's... The first thing, an attitude of curiosity, an attitude of humility, an attitude which simply uh, is founded in the fact that God is greater than our understanding. In Arabic, that would be Allahu Akbar. So God is always greater. Then, at the same time, what is characteristic for comparative theology is that it stays in the own faith tradition. So. It's uh, so you stay committed to the truth claims of your tradition and you don't negotiate them. Okay, if you like that better, maybe we change something here. You stay committed in your tradition, you're humble, you know that you don't understand everything and that you might learn, but it's clearly within the confessional approach of a certain tradition. And you have the trust that people from different uh, traditions can understand each other, which of course is nothing you can prove uh, philosophically. It's a trust in the end, a trust also in the Holy Spirit, so that something like understanding across religious borders is possible. So to avoid a kind of cultural relativism that everybody has his or her own, own truth, no, we are seeking for one truth and try to understand each other in this perspective. Um, and then what is very specific for comparative theology is now that we try to do that in a way which is empathetic 
in an also emotional way with people from other religions. So we try to, uh, to be vulnerable in some sense, uh, like uh, sharing the vulnerability that God shows on the cross. So if you want to have a Christian uh, reasoning for it, so the vulnerability and empathy is the decisive move within comparative theology. You really try to understand through opening your heart for being affected by what you learn by your friends and colleagues and partners in dialogue. That can lead to a situation that at the moment you cannot understand. So when we're 15 years old, I had that extreme experience of beauty during eating that date, and usually I don't like dates. So this was something I couldn't make any sense of it. And Frank Clooney, for example, one of the inventors, a Jesuit in Rome, who invented kind of that idea of comparative theology that I tried to explain today, he uh, witnesses a situation he had in a Hindu temple, like that he was just sharing the ritual in a sense of participative observation. But then the, 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 the goddess just looked at him. And he said, wow, that's, is she really looking at me? That's not possible. She cannot watch me. She's, in the end, it's not a goddess, right? So, but the experience was being looked at. So that there's a dialogical encounter, some coming from the other side. But at that moment, he couldn't make any sense of it. The idea of comparative theology is that you do not make this fit to your own framework. I know already everything. Oh, that fits. Perfect. Wonderful. But also to see, OK, there's something I cannot, I cannot make sense of it. But it happened. And then years of study, sometimes decades of study, help you to understand what you uh, have experienced. Or maybe you never understand it. But the point is, to be vulnerable here, so to, to, to be honest. There was something that I cannot explain at the moment, but that's what should happen if theology is really talking about ultimate truth and uh, God. And the last thing is hospitality, mutual hospitality, not only for the other as person, but also for the thinking of the other person that I try to learn from it and engage with it. So that's about the attitudes. Now let me briefly say a few words about how to do comparative theology. I said already, um, this was a quotation from Jim Fredericks, a Catholic priest in Los Angeles, who was uh, also one of the first pioneers of comparative theology. He says famously in one of his books, doing theology comparatively means crossing over into the world of another religious believer and learning the truths that animate the life of that believer. Doing theology comparatively also means coming back to Christianity, transformed by these truths, now able to ask new questions about Christian faith and its meaning for today. So the first step is turning over, really going to another tradition, not directly with your questions, but really learning, being with those people. So typically, with this means, uh, for example, what Nasreen did, coming all over from Iran, doing the PhD in, in, in Germany, and exposing yourself to another country, another tradition, and learning, learning Catholic theology in that, uh, this case. So learning in the other tradition without knowing what will be the result. And then when you have done that for some years, then come back to your own tradition and see how this could have informed you, how you can try to bring things together. So the first step, if you want to do that, is really learning within the framework of other religions. And I'm so glad that here at the Gregorian, you also have a Muslim teacher, and um, so with Adnan Mokhani, so that is possible. In our context, not everybody can go for years in another culture and religion, but at least that also within the education of your, in your own religion, you are also in a certain moment exposed to somebody from another religion and supposed to learn from him. So this is the first step, turning over to other religious traditions and worldviews. And then when you come back, 
Of course, there are many questions you have in mind and many things you could think about. But you cannot solve all problems at the same time. Theology is an academic discipline, like all academic disciplines. You have to choose a very small topic. You have to work what I call micrologically. So this micrological turn is very important because the theology of religions always tries to relate religions as a whole. And that leads, in the end, to very complicated systems which um, help you to avoid uh, real encounters with other religions. So it might be better really to engage in particularities. That's very much the idea here of comparative theology. And of course now, which particularity can you engage? And that's important that you do not simply choose something which is easy or um, something which goes quickly but that you adopt that uh, what I call a problem-solving approach. So in some sense, you start with your own weakness. You start with the moment where you don't know, where you want to learn something. If I'm so proud of a certain doctrine with my own faith, why would I compare it with another religious tradition? In the end, the best the other religious tradition can end up is being as good as I am, and probably this will not be the result. So it's better to church with something where you seek for responses. So for example, a big question within Catholic faith today is how to deal with the question of equality of men and women, ordination of women for priests. It's a big discussion, at least in Germany. So it's quite interesting that a colleague from uh, Los Angeles, Tracy T. Meyer, she, she was engaging exactly that question with the help of an Eastern religion and going and using her uh, discoveries there to engage this question. So we need burning questions, otherwise it's not relevant. And we have to show how we can help to work on those burning questions with the help of approaching other religions. And of course, it has to be done with this attitude of vulnerability and hospitality. So it has to be done in an attitude that does not simply use the other's religion to fix a problem in your own, uh, own religion. But it has to be in a way, do you allow me to borrow something? Does this make sense for you? So in a dialogical atmosphere and spirit, that's why usually comparative theology is cooperative theology. And we always do it together, like uh, Nasreen, for example, until today had to share her office always with a Christian colleague so that they see each other every day. And we have that kind of dialogical enterprise in your education, which of course uh, might lead to friendship, but which always leads to permanent intellectual exchange for years. And which means you do not simply take something back to your own tradition, but you keep on going back and forth and trying to develop things together and at the same time for your own community and not as a no, new uh, faith community of hybrid people seeking for something new. So what is very important um, in my own philosophical approach to comparative theology is that you do not do everything just among the two who are doing dialogue or co cooperate, but that you always find third parties, third instances challenging you. That's why in our group, we from the very beginning said we will do it in a Jewish, Christian, Muslim way. So no Muslim Christian encounter without Jews, no Jewish Christian encounter without Muslims. It's a big problem in Germany today that uh, the church has separated that very much. So we have the Jewish-Christian dialogue and the Muslim-Christian, something completely else. And now we lack uh, the community which can address those burning political issues that we have after the 7th October. So I think it's very important that we find common language and that we have third instances. And that's not always a religious voice. These can also be um, atheist voices. That can be voices from other cultural traditions. So. In the end, it's a never-ending process, always bringing third instances which challenge you and help you to develop your thought further because this helps you to discover hidden rules within your own thinking, hidden parts of your own grammar. 
You might have experienced this. If you go to a completely new country, a new, completely new environment, you learn something about your own faith, your own tradition, but you didn't know before. For example, my eldest daughter, when she went to Canada to learn English during high school, the idea was not to learn anything on her faith. It was simply going there to learn English. But she ended up to be in a Protestant family, and she was very happy I'm being will be with Protestants. And she thought, from her German experience, Protestants are very liberal, so it won't be so conservative like with my father, who is Catholic, with his many conservative values. So she was very excited. Then it ended up coming to a Baptist family, <laughs> a very extremely conservative Baptist family, praying for her soul every day because she was only Catholic and so this will bring her to, to hell. So the interesting thing was she learned to love that family. That family loved her as her own daughter. She still has very good relations to them. But still, she also learned a lot of things about Catholic faith, and she was so happy being a Catholic in the end, and that we have Nostra Aetate and things like that. So. The dialogue can help you to reaffirm your identity, but also to discover things that you weren't aware of. And that's the decisive thing where you need third instances to see again and again parts of the grammar that you are not uh, aware of. So my last point, just a word on the forms of learning. So which kind of learning do we have? So what are the results usually of comparative theology? Catherine Cornell, one of the most important pioneers of comparative theology at Boston College, she distinguishes six forms of learning, and I think they're very um, uh, helpful. And because I, I worked a lot on Christology and on Jesus and the Quran, in brackets, I give just one example from my own work on Jesus and the Quran, uh, which I had uh, to illustrate those forms of learning. So first form of learning which exists, and it's completely fine if that happens, is that after exposing yourself to another religious tradition, deep learning, even for decades, it might be that in the end you're very happy that you don't believe that stuff what you, uh, that you learned. But still, you look at it in a different way. So when my daughter came back, she reaffirmed being a Catholic, but she knew new things. And still she valued the Jesus Youth Club of that Baptist community, and he came to my parish and wanted to, wanted to open a Jesus Youth Club. But it was simply integrated in her own Catholic faith. And so um, the reaffirmation can be many things. For me, it's, of course, the divinity of Christ after all the discussions with Muslims. But um, the reaffirmation wants to say, OK, you look at it in a deeper way, you understand it better. But in the end, it's quite close to apologetics. That's why it's important to have the other forms of learning. Intensification is, of course, the easiest way of learning. You simply say, oh, what you are saying is so close to mine that fits perfect. Like in the Quran, I see Jesus is the word of God, wonderful. Even the Messiah, great. So I cannot get more excited than that. That's just intensification. You're saying what I already know, wonderful. Also legitimate, that's OK. You can have your reaffirmations and intensifications, both as comparative theology. But it would be not very uh, innovative if this is all. So the next, uh, so the, the, the order is uh, the, it becomes, the learning becomes more and more. But uh, you don't need always all of those learnings. But the next one would be the recovery. So you, or rediscovery. Through engaging in another religious tradition, you learn something on your own tradition uh, which you have forgotten. Like the beauty of liturgy was not in my mind as a young person. I was really with a, uh, I wanted to have, uh, like, um, I loved, uh, religious pop songs and things like that. I wasn't so open for the rich liturgical tradition. But through encountering Islam, that helped me to encounter also the aesthetical dimension of traditional Catholic liturgy. And in uh, the question of Christology, I really learned appreciating how important it is that Jesus was also a prophet. 
So to see that important notion within the Bible, it's an important biblical Bible, important uh, thing in the self-understanding of Jesus, and this was something I rediscovered through dialogue with the Quran and with Muslims. Next step would be appropriation. Uh, so I know that in post-colonial studies, people don't like that too much, but it's quite important that we do that within the religious tradition. We appropriate concepts that help us. And I think the Quranic concept of prophetology is extremely helpful for a Christian theology that wants to develop a non-supersessionist Christology. That's what I'm doing currently in one of my research projects. Next step is a reinterpretation. So the attempt to use concept that you learn from another religious tradition to reinterpret what is the decisive heart of your own religious faith, something like Jesus on the cross. How can the encounter with the Quran help me to get deeper into that and to reinterpret that? That's something what challenged us a lot at this conference. We had three papers on crucifixion and the Quranic account on that. And the question is, is there ways of reinterpretation through using new philosophical concepts here? And the last thing, of course, that's the uh, most difficult thing, is really the rectification. So that you say, I learned something from you, and I see what I said before was wrong. Like, for example, in the Christian tradition, we have, I don't know whether you know that, but the church fathers were quite confident that Jesus had a human nature which doesn't need to eat. Like Adam and Eve didn't need to eat in the paradise, and because Jesus and Mary were without original sin, the idea in the mainstream was very much so they don't have to, to eat and to drink. Um, and uh, today, of course, we would say it's wrong. Uh, they, we would all agree that probably, at least the theologians I know, would all agree that Jesus and Mary were drinking because of their human nature they needed to drink. But this was not clear in the time of the Quran. And it was even the majority mainstream position that this is not the case, so it's a rectification when the Quran says in, surah, in verse 75 of Surah Al-Ma'ida that they used to eat their daily food, which is a perfect last word because this is an important thing for what uh, Nasreen will tell us about Mary and the Quran. And uh, so I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will give over the word directly to Nasreen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, nice presentation and very clear and helping us to understand the uh, even the, a new approach to comparative theology. And now uh, I introduce um, Nasreen Bani Asadi, Dr. Nasreen Bani Asadi, already. Uh, uh, Professor von Storch already introduced her a little bit, and uh, she's a scholar uh, at uh, the same university in Bonn, and uh, she um, got a PhD in the theory of religion and interreligious dialogue at the same university, and published the book on uh, Freedom Revisited in 2024, uh, which is a comparative theological approach to the question of free will uh, in, uh, in Islam. And now uh, today's talk uh, goes in the direction of uh, uh, Mariology. And the title is From Mariology to Anthropology, the Implications of a Comparative Theological Approach to Mary in the Quran for Islamic Anthropology. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you everyone for uh, being uh, here. Uh, so some of you may know that already my colleague Mona Tatari was supposed to give this talk but she couldn't make it. 
And uh, so I was, I was uh, her replacement, but as a matter of respect to the topic that she wanted to present, which has um, to do with her research that she did together with Klaus von Stosch in the book Mary in the Quran, uh, I tried to keep that, but uh, try to um, make a bridge between uh, the, the research that they did in that book to my field, which is uh, Quranic anthropology, and my work on freedom um, is focused on Quranic um, anthropology. So, so that's the background of the topic, and um, so let's move. Um, yeah, so the book uh, is translated in uh, English. Um, it was published in 2021 um, yeah, by uh, Mona Tatari and uh, Klaus von Storch. And um, it's a very, um, I really recommend this book because what I'm going to pre um, present in this talk, it's very, very little tiny of what is uh, in the book and is very much, um, um, so it's a very wide and uh, deep research. So what I'm going to uh, actually address in this presentation are three learning methods uh, of uh, the learning methods that uh, Klaus just uh, mentioned. Um, so the first one that I want to talk about is a recovery and um, of course, I'm not Mona, so that's uh, what I'm going to present is the way that I relate to her research. And um, um, so you will see that there are some examples which are brought by me, but um, that's how I received the book, actually. Um, so I want to make that clear. Um, so that's another reason that you should read the book itself. <laughs> Uh, and the second, um, so the first one is recovery, and uh, it is about uh, a comparison um, between the figure of Mary and uh, the Prophet Muhammad, and how the stories and the narratives about Mary in the Quran relate to the Prophet Muhammad himself, and uh, how the element of vulnerability becomes important as, as an. Um, as a characteristic of the prophet, and you already see that in the Quran, but before going through this uh, comparative theological uh, steps, maybe it was not as clear as it should have been. So it's somehow recovered this element of uh, the, the characteristic in the um, prophet. And uh, the second one is a reinterpretation, and. Um, so it has to do with uh, the way that Mary relates uh, to the um, word of God. So like um, uh, the way that she actually connects to Jesus and, uh, and the word of God. And I am using the key term common humanity. And this is the key term that I am using. It's not in the book. Um, and I'm using it because I think that it has very um, important psychological impacts um, when it comes to um, I don't know, in psychology, for example, when you want to talk about self-compassion and this stuff, the element of common humanity is important. And I think that from a theological perspective, uh, you, can, uh, also, you can include this uh, psychological element, but have the view that this compassion is coming from God. So um, I do not see self-compassion and the way that God, uh, I perceive that God is being compassionate to me. I do not see them like separated as a believer. Um, yeah, and the, and the third uh, one is rectification, which uh, goes into the direction of uh, what Klaus just mentioned about uh, the imperial discourse, and uh, we will see how that rectifies the Muslim view of Christianity and also of political theology. So that's, um, yeah, what's to come. So just to give a um, very brief overview of what's going on in the Quran, I uh, want to introduce this uh, chronology of uh, Quranic surahs. Um, so the mission of Prophet Muhammad is divided uh, into two parts, the Meccan part and the Medinan part. The Meccan part is the uh, 13 years of his uh, mission um, that he had different phases of um, announcing his message. And then there is a migration to another uh, city in order to protect the community from the um, harms of the society in Mecca, so that's the Medinan period. And the Meccan period itself is divided into three parts, early Meccan, middle Meccan, and late Meccan. So the first um, in mention of Mary in the uh, prophetic mission uh, actually occurs um, in the middle Meccan period. So 
the first time that the figure of Mary is introduced is in this period, and um, so that's um, the period that concerns basically the first part of my talk. I mean, the first um, learning method. So, um, I already said that this recovery has to do with a comparison between the figure of Mary and uh, Muhammad, and um, Mona has, um, so let me start with why uh, Mona has, um, why, why this is a comparative theological perspective. Um, Mona has written that for her, she's not adopting the uh, Christian uh, dogma of um, Jesus being the word of God as, as and I think that she means that the Jesus being the word of God is not a building block for our theology, for Islamic theology, but let's um, follow the steps and uh, see what it looks like if we take serious uh, the Jesus being the word of God. And by taking serious, I mean that, um, for example, in the Quran, there is also the talk of Abraham being the friend of God. But this is also understood as, um, you know, a um, metaphor or something to show the closeness of Abraham to God. The word of Jesus being the word of God has been treated the same way, but um, so the aim of this comparative theological approach is that let's take that Jesus being the word of God like seriously and perhaps literally and see what comes uh, out. So, the, when, um, so that becomes important when we compare Mary and uh, Muhammad because Muhammad is also the receiver of uh, the divine speech, Kalam Allah, um, and uh, Mary is uh, receiving Jesus and in the Quran, Jesus is uh, literally spoken of kalimatihi, uh, uh, which means the, his word, this is word of God, and kalimatun uh, min, a word from God, from him. Um, and uh, there is one more, uh, so there are el different elements to compare Jesus, I just was selective <laughs> about what to present. So one element which is uh, also make their case um, come close to each other is um, uh, an element of unprecedented in this encounter with the word of God. And what, what I mean by that is that um, Mary, by giving uh, birth to Jesus and in, in a state of uh, virginity, uh, so f for her, um, there was so there, was, there is this Quranic verse which says that no man has touched me, so how can I uh, give birth to a child? And um, this shows that already there is some, um, something which is not expected from Mary. You know, this is, um, as I say, it was, it was unpre unprecedented. Um, and this is the same case for Muhammad when he receives the word of God. He is uh, described in the Quran as an, a messenger for the Ummis, and um, so, and, and the description of that is that he hasn't written a scripture with his hands. So Ummi is uh, interpreted as either illiterate. One could, I mean, traditionally it has been understood as illiterate that the Prophet did not know how to write, and uh, so that is really miraculous that there was the book of Quran coming. Uh, from him, but uh, there is also another interpretation which uh, has to do with he not having been writing scripture, like holy scripture. He was, um, nobody expected that a prophet from the um, Arab society, uh, society could emerge and um, this uh, lack of a scripture, this so that was also very much unexpected. And um, so depending on how you understand Ummi, this element is working, that's what I want to um, say. And the third element which uh, I want to elaborate upon is uh, the factor of vulnerability. Now that we see that there are already elements in the uh, uh, prophet, um, prof yeah, there's uh, elements similar in both of them, and there is one thing which becomes um, uh, they're actually the point that they, they connects them more, even more. Um, so as I said, that this is the uh, the first uh, mention of Mary in the Quran occurs in the Middle Meccan period, and um, the Middle Meccan period itself is divided into early Middle Meccan and late Middle Meccan. So the early Middle Meccan is the time that the Prophet starts to um, give the message to um, so make it public, and by public it means that first of all, let's. Um, so he gives the message to his family, the members of his own family, and um, to, so 
it's still like the Meccan community, first the closer circle and then. And this closer circle did not receive the word very friend, in a friendly way. So um, two of the like, biggest opposers of the Prophet are uh, his uncles. And uh, he's already like, in a state of seeing hardship. And um, now we see that how this situation relates to the Surah Maryam, uh, in which, um, as I said, the first mention of Mary uh, takes place. So there are some uh, elements of Mary's vulnerability in this um, surah that I want to uh, speak of. So the first of them has to do with her uh, giving um, birth. At the moment of giving birth, uh, she has this um, pain. So when the pain of childbirth drove her to clinch to the trunk of a palm tree, she exclaimed, I wish I had been dead and forgotten long before all this. This is like a very, very state of weakness and you see that um, to what extent this uh, state had, has brought Mary and um, so these um, dots mean that something happens in between and I just want to tell you so at this moment there comes a voice um, that tells her that she can um, so a voice could be like the interpretation is again open it could be the voice of the Gabriel or the baby Jesus because according to the Quran narrative uh, baby Jesus could speak, uh, and it, uh, in, uh, he actually speaks in the verse that you see uh, coming. Um, yeah, so there comes an instruction from this voice telling that, okay, there is a palm tree, just um, shut up, um, just make the dates come uh, off, and then she can eat, and then there is water here, you can drink, and then she's given support. Um, physical support and probably also psychological through this voice. And um, she's also commanded to be silent at this very, very special and critical moment of her life. So she is going to go back to her family, bringing, the, bringing Jesus, the word of God, to the people, and she has to be silent. This is just very, very um, most vulnerable state that a human being can be. So. Um, what happens? I mean, that's um, what we see in the um, uh, verse after that. She went back to her people carrying the child and they said, Mary, you have done something terrible. Sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man. Your mother was not unchaste. Uh, she pointed at him, and uh, so at him it means the um, Jesus, baby Jesus. They said, how can we converse with an infant? This is just a moment of... Um, not believing. But then the, the narrative moves on to say that Jesus says, um, greeting, uh, yeah, um, so it starts speaking, defending Mary, and saying that greetings to me. And so the narrative goes on like that. Um, so now we compare the situation to Muhammad's. Um, so I chose these verses from the uh, exactly the early middle Meccan period. So it's parallel to, in, to the time that Prophet is uh, receiving the Surah Maryam. So you see that in uh, Surah 20, there is a talk of um, the Prophet being distressed by the word of God. So I, it was not, to, it, it means the word, uh, the, the Quran was not to distress you that we sent down the Quran to you, but as a reminder for those who hold God in awe, a revelation from the one who created. So, um, so you see that um, so, and in the tradition, we already have the talk of prophets being so much, uh, you know, it has been very heavy to receive the word of God. He was, um, yeah, there are descriptions of the prophet that he became very much like psychologically like trembling and all this. So there was already this element and, and um, added to that was uh, the difficulty of bringing it to the people and also facing rejection. That was also something that uh, was the cause of this um, being distressed. And um, so there, is, there, there are uh, some other instances uh, which is about the gradual uh, revelation. So Prophet had to be patient, waiting for the message to come, and then he has to go through difficulties, but still being patient for this uh, gradual um, revelation. And um, yeah, in the last verse, we are well aware that your heart is weighed down by what they say. So 
the instruction, I mean, as an antidote to that, to this difficulty, the last verse says, celebrate the glory of your Lord and be among those who prostrate before him, worship your Lord until what is certain comes to you. Um, yeah, so there, is, there are two elements here in, this, in these verses which are important uh, from the Islamic uh, perspective. And uh, one of them is patience, the other is like prayer, sabra wa salat. There are two elements which become important at moments of suffering. And um, you see that already in the Prophet is uh, commanded for bo for, to, to both of them. And um, yeah, so let me make sure that I haven't... Um, yeah, and I want to argue further that these two elements uh, have an aesthetic dimension. And this is the point that uh, I want to refer to the recovery. That um, So the, the patience, the element of patience in Surah Joseph, uh, Surah um, 12 of the Quran, uh, is described as beautiful. So when Jacob has lost um, Joseph, he cries a very um, a lot, and then his patience is, is described as a beautiful patience. So he's commanded to have this um, beautiful patience in him. So you already see that there is an element, uh, aesthetic element in this. And um, so. So, and, and the, element, the second element which has to do with prayer, I want to compare the way that Mary's worship and Muhammad's worship are uh, being uh, discussed in the uh, Quran. So the first one, um, yeah, so the, the, the verse that I already mentioned about the gradual revelation also uh, mentions um, the prayer. So remember the name of your Lord at dawn and in the evening, prostrate before him and glorify him at length by night. And... Um, yeah, and this was just uh, um, just made uh, emphasis on the prayer part of the previous sli uh, slide. And uh, we also see the same thing uh, with respect to Mary, but of course this is like the Medinan uh, verse, which doesn't um, fit like the middle Meccan, but I just want to know how uh, to, to say why we... Um, we are allowed to make this comparison because, because in a Medinan context, Mary is also like described as is commanded to be uh, devote to your Lord, prostrate yourself in worship, bow down with those who pray. And um, so this, this way of worship, um, I want to argue in the next slide that this also has an aesthetic element in it. And this uh, finds... Um, uh, actually, it becomes meaningful when we see the prophetic practice in the early Meccan period. So, um, yeah, so already in the Surah Maryam, in the middle Meccan um, time, Mary is described as, um, so, so she, in order to receive the word of God, she has to make a separation between herself and um, people. So, um, in the, the prophet, and remember, so prophet remember Mary uh, in the book when she withdrew from her family to an eastern place and she veiled herself from them. Then we sent unto her our spirit. So this element of separation from the um, people becomes again uh, something that um, I want to um, elaborate on. So you see that in the early Meccan uh, verses, there is also uh, the, prof the pra pr prophetic practice of um, covering yourself. You know, the prophet is described as, oh, you enfolded in your uh, cloak. Stay up through the night, all, um, but, uh, but, so it's a bit complicated. It's just describing how you can timely do that. And then we shall send a weighty word down to you. Again, for the prophet, this state of just, um, being uh, covered or somehow uh, like distantiated from the world to receive the word of God is um, playing a role. And again, the next surah, uh, again, uh, O you prophet cloaked one, uh, arise and one, praise your Lord, purify your uh, clothes, avoid impurity, and I will ex explain what uh, this impurity could mean. Do not bestow favor, uh, favors, seeking favors seeking gain, and be patient in waiting for your Lord. Again, you see that the element of um, patience and uh, prayer are playing a role here. So, um, yeah, so in order to 
bring the case of Mary and Muhammad under the um, um, an aesthetic perspective, I want to um, lose like Angelika Neubert. And let me tell you that um, these are all like in the book of Mary in the Quran. But when I was reading the book, I was just thinking about like the flow of thought brought me to presenting the work like this. So um, I take responsibility for all the examples that I'm bringing uh, to this talk. Um, yeah, so Angelika Neubert, uh, and this is the third instance that Klaus was mentioning. It is important that in the comparative theology, we do not compare the text and, and be happy that, oh yeah, we found uh, this. <laughs> but it's important to see that pe people that do philological research could also um, somehow confirm or it's important to see what they say. And uh, I found in Angelika Neuwert that she refers to um, Tor Andres' placement of the nightly prayer, which was in the early Meccan surahs, which was commended to the prophet. She um, refers to researchers who have already contextualized this practice in a Christian context. So it's a, um, it's a practice which was already known in the um, Christian context. and. Um, the, the verse which talks about impurity, avoid fahjur, uh, so avoid means fahjur, impurity, ruj, and it's an, so this is like, again, the philological research which says it is an Aramaic loan word from rujza, wrath, uh, and punishing judgment, and um, so that this is like quote from Neubert, in the Eastern Church liturgy, the prayer to be exempted from the contestations of wrath, is uh, common in the evening prayer. So um, you see again that the, n the notion of rojas here also has to do with patience. And, um, and so that's why I would uh, still uh, think that uh, the two elements of uh, sabr and um, like patience and um, prayer are playing a static role, specifically just separating yourself. And it was very interesting. I was thinking about this, and then I read the whole surah, and then the verse 10, I saw actually that the Quran is speaking of the Prophet's separation uh, from the community as beautiful. So bear patiently what uh, that which they say and take leave of them um, in a beautiful manner. Hajran Jamilan. So, um, so for me, as a Muslim, it was very important to see that there is an element of uh, beauty in, in, in the relation to God, and already um, the prophet is, is an example of that, and through the example of Mary, I came to uh, realize that. So that was, um, and of course, this is also the experience that uh, Muna is sharing in the uh, uh, book. So let me uh, make sure that I didn't. Um, so this, um, yeah, this was the recovery uh, part, and I hope that I have enough time for. Um, so the common uh, humanity section is um, about how um, Mary actually experienced the world of God. The, sorry, the word of God. And so Mona Tatari made this very interesting um, observation of uh, the. Um, uh, so in Luke um, ch chapter 1, verse 38, we have this um, Mary saying yes to God, which is uh, in Catholic uh, th um, theology known as fiat. And uh, we also um, have it had a similar notion in uh, Surah 66, verse 12, where um, yeah, Mary is also confirming the word of God. And uh, the term used for confirmation is sad taqat. Um, and um, yeah, and she was among uh, the devotedly obedient. So uh, I'm really sorry. May I ask how much time do I have? I'm just a bit getting worried. Seven minutes. Really? Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, again, Mary. Sorry, Muna <laughs> says that um, in the um, so in the Mary, in the experience of. Uh, so in the, in the Bible, there is the talk of Mary actually having conflicts with Jesus. And for her, this aspect of Mary's relation to the word of God is, um, brings her to a reinterpretation of the um, Islamic notion of um, um, Islamic way of understanding relating to God. So Mary, with all her um, you know, purity, with all her 
Um, so you see that in these um, verses of the Quran, you already can see there are elements, um, like for example, the grandmother, of, um, yeah, sorry, the mother of Mary is uh, praying for uh, her child being saved from the, um, so be protected from the Satan and all these um, elements are there. So God has chosen Mary and this is like very important uh, statement, but still, um, she has, so speaking with the Bible, she has still conflicts with Jesus. Then how can we understand uh, like um, this, uh, like, like these moments? And um, so for Mona, it becomes important that uh, in the experience of Mary, the human experience is recognized. So our way of um, feeling that we are somehow distance from God, but at the same time, in a state of having said yes to God, there are some moments that you still feel there is a distance. It doesn't, uh, it shouldn't be something scary or would make you say that, oh, I cannot uh, accept that. Um, so did you see that already, like from, from the biblical uh, perspective, this is there, there is this dynamism, but still Mary is, uh, has uh, the, um, so, so she's the perfect example of saying yes to God. And uh, I was thinking that maybe in the Quran, the verse, the last verse that I have mentioned could be understood as that moment. You know, there is no, of course, Mona says that there is no report in the Quran of the conflict between Jesus and Mary. But I was thinking that um, already in where she is uh, saying that I wish I had been dead and forgotten long before all this, this could also be a moment that she is experiencing this um, moment of distanciation, which doesn't uh, contradict her state of being chosen and um, yeah, being uh, protected from the Satan. So this uh, common humanity element um, is important to see that even, I mean, for all of us, there are moments in life that we are um, facing despair and all this, but still it, it shouldn't be something that um, should make us feel that we are cursed or anything because um, it's part of human experience and so now I'm trying to bring my uh, make the bridge here because the um, capability, uh, the capacity to be feeling like distanced from um, the word of God or or uh, from God is part of uh, the the common human experience, and it has to do with uh, the human beings' um, unconditional formal unconditionality of free will. So this is a philosophical term, and I just want to just say it in a um, like simple terms that um, for me, in order to, be f to have free will, I have to make sure that there are moments that I can, um, not the moments, in, in general, I can, dis I can be, dis I have the ability to distance myself. And this distanciation could also happen with respect to, um, to, to, to God or even um, the experience, to, to have this experience. And um, so from here, what I'm saying is uh, absolutely on my responsibility. Then Klaus can criticize me, of course, for whatever I've just said. But um, I think that um, this resonates uh, very well with the uh, notion of um, the human being saying a free yes, yes out of freedom to God and participating in um, divine symbolic, symbolic acts, which is like the key term in the book about um, this experience, Mary, Marian, Marianic experience. And uh, for me as a um, Muslim, uh, this saying yes to God is also having, uh, having some responsibilities. And um, in my book, so because just Klaus mentioned that uh, when we do comparative theology, we do not know what is the result. We just started, and from my personal experience, I started the, with the question of freedom and free will, and I ended up with the question of justice, and I could understand the notion of justice in the Quran better in, that, in the light of this uh, comparative uh, approach. So, um, so and the idea is that upholding justice is an uh, indicator uh, of this participation um, in the um, divine act. And um, this also resonates, and, and this is again Mona's observation, that this, uh, um, the relevance, the, so the political societal relevance of Mary became clear to her after um, seeing the 
after uh, encountering Magnificat in the Bible. So there is this um, um, uh, song of, about the, um, the poor and the oppression, and this gave, gave a political dimension to the figure of Mary, and for Mona that was decisive to go through these uh, steps, and finally, this is the <laughs> last uh, part of the uh, book, so what does this have? I mean, if I am saying that, okay, upholding justice is important, Mary is a figure, uh, um, also uh, to make it relevant for uh, the um, for a political theology, then we have to be uh, conscious of several things. And uh, I will be very quick because I think that this uh, topic was mentioned uh, already by Klaus, that, um, okay, so at the time, I don't know, do you think that it worth, I mean, uh, because I'm, Just or we can have it. Yeah, you can have a few minutes more. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah, that, because this is very important and it has like consequences. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so when we are talking about um, the Quranic Mary, what um, the, the question is that, okay, I want to make it relevant for my human experience. The human experience also includes the society, the politics and everything, but I have to be conscious about something. And um, again, this is like something that the third instance provided for both Chris, uh, for both, I think, Mona and Klaus, because that was the third instance that was very instructive for both Muslim uh, theology and Christian theology. So when you see at what point in the, um, at the time of the prophet, this is the discourse which is going on in the Quran, you see that this was the situation of the world. <laughs> there we have two important empires, uh, one the Byzantine and the Sassanids, and this clash between the empires made, made already a um, um, religio-political discourse in the region, and you see that Mecca is not very far from this uh, thing, so it's very um, probable, I mean, likely that this could have been also affecting um, the discourses in um, Arabia. So to put a very long story short, let me um, just say that um, the emperor Heraclius at the time of um, the pro at the time that the prophet starts to receive revelation, there was uh, a emperor of the Byzantine, at, um, and it was a scandal during his time that in 614, uh, the Sassanids con uh, conquered Jerusalem, and, they, they, uh, and the Byzantine Empire loses this very uh, important city for Christianity. And um, so, in the 630, the Byzantine Empire is again able to uh, conquer the um, Jerusalem, but in between, there is a very, very long story <laughs> taking place. So in the meantime, there is a Jewish-Christian um, conflict over the Messiah and the uh, clash of their apocalyptic expectations. But why? Why did this happen and how are <laughs> Jews uh, like, uh, coming to this? So it all has to do with uh, Heraclius' uh, pr um, war propaganda against the Sassanids because he made the clash with the Sassanid Empire as a holy uh, war, and um, in this, uh, so the, the people, th those who were killed in this war were uh, considered as um, martyrs, and. Um, there are reports that Mary was considered uh, as if she is a goddess of war in this conflict. So Heraclius made a case and um, using actually the icons of Mary and um, to, to uh, argue that she is um, in, uh, in, uh, she's not vulnerable, so she is the protector of the Byzantine Empire and that was how she used Mary in the propaganda. And so he made of himself a messianic figure, thinking that he was the one who was brought, bringing the kingdom of God. And um, simultaneously, because of his this Christian agenda, he simultaneously increased pressure on the Jewish sectors of the populace, which made the Jews side um, with the Sassanids, at least in, in their hearts, to where they were happy that the Jerusalem was no more at the hands of the Christians, so they, um, and they uh, started to make uh, some, um, to like narrate messianic narratives that could uh, somehow be in line with this, um, with, in, with this setting. And we see that, um, for example, 
Yeah, Zishan Rafar, again, he's the third instance in this, uh, one of the third instances, uh, that has um, t talked about the Quranic instance in this conflict between the um, Jewish and Christian messianic um, claims. And then uh, the Quran refrains from any apocalyptic discourse bound with messianic hope so uh, re-narrates re um, some uh, narratives in a way that this messianic hope is somehow absent from there, and by that way um, is already like um, not contributing to that discourse. So this is very important to uh, see that, uh, and this is in this uh, Quranic discourse that the um, the Quranic Mariology could be understood. So Quran. Um, Quranic Mariology, besides all, created a counter discourse to the imperial misuse of Mary in Heraclius propaganda. And um, as an example, I just wanted to mention, but Klaus mentioned this already, that um, the fact that Mary and Jesus could eat was important. Um, so it was uh, the fact that they, are, they, are, they could not eat was a, um, an interpretation which was misused, again, in the propaganda of Heraclius. And uh, we see that the Quran is emphasizing that, and uh, of course they could eat, and uh, so this is a direct response and direct reaction to that uh, sort of um, discourse. So what changes, I mean, the, the consequences for Islamic theology is that, um, yes, um, I mean, anthropologically, the figure of Mary is important, um, but when it comes to politics, we have to be very cautious that we do not end up with, with the same um, political discourse. And this also changes the Islamic attitudes towards, uh, so here I'm talking about Christianity, so the attitudes towards Christianity that uh, such verses are no more regarded as an absolute rejection of the uh, Christian um, uh, doctrines. We have to be, in this, we have to be uh, careful of the context. So case by case, the context should be uh, viewed and see what is the point of re uh, the uh, criticism and how it is related to the, con the late antiquity uh, context. Sorry that I took so long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Nasrin. I think we could not imagine to have such implications from uh, you know, Mariology, so thank you very much. I think it's very nice. Uh, and also, it's really a concrete example of comparative theology and dialogue, what we had during these days. Um, I, I think that we are starting the new academic year of the Center for Interreligious Studies in this wonderful way. Today is the first day of the academic year, so I'm glad that we started this you know, way with the people, with friends and colleagues here.